just a few words first um, to say that we are here. So this is Trento. This is a suburb of Trento called Povo, and uh, here where uh, our facilities are. And what do we do there? There is a bachelor and a master degree uh, based on biotechnology. And there is research activity with groups that study uh, neurobiology, RNA biology, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to come for postdoc or whatever, take into consideration Trento. It's not too bad. OK, so let's start talking about HIV, but not only HIV. This is the basic structure the, the simplest structure of retrovirus. You have only three genetic regions which encode for GAG, POL, and ENV. This is needed to make structural and enzymatic activity of, of, uh, of retroviruses. And uh, this is what we're going to see today. I cut out uh, from the life cycle of HIV, actually uh, something that you study here, which is post-transcriptional stuff. But, uh, a virus comes out of the producer cells, is assembled here, and then infect a new cell. Uh, it fuses with the, with the new cells, and the core of the virus is delivered into the cytoplasm. You get reverse transcription and uncoating here going on. Then this complex has to enter the nucleus or access, anyway, the genome of the host cells before getting integrated there. So retroviruses, as you know, the hallmark of retroviruses is reverse transcription of the genome. Originally, they have RNA in the virus particle. Well, let's say prevalently RNA. Sometimes there is DNA also. And, uh, and then the ability to integrate. So the infection is a, a, an irreversible uh, process. And uh, as I said, today we're not going to look at things that happen after integration. We're going to see uh, exactly this. Uh, uh, this section of, of, the, of the life cycle of retroviruses. Now, this is, as I said, uh, the structure of all retroviruses, the simple structure of retroviruses. But in reality, uh, there is a much more complex situation for many retrovirus genomes. So this is the, 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 um, the simplest, OK? Uh, because you have these uh, so-called accessory proteins. Um, this is the case of HIV, uh, where you have uh, this protein V, VPR, VPU, NEF, and then you have TAT and REV. Now, TAT and REV are actually not that accessory because uh, they're essential for, uh, for virus replication. They regulate uh, transcription and, uh, anyway, expression of, of uh, retroviral genome, as, as you know. Uh, but the other proteins, such as VIF, VPU, NEF, and, and VPR, uh, they've been obscure. Th their function has been a bit obscure for, for a long time. Because, um, well, only uh, one second only to say that uh, uh, so you have retroviruses in, 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 in the retroviral world that have very simple genome. And, uh, but you have also many retroviruses that are complex. So it's important to understand the role of these uh, so-called accessory proteins. So I was saying these proteins have often an obscure function. Why? Because, well, if you look at what happened in, in, in the context of a natural infection, everything that is needed, right? You wouldn't imagine a virus to develop a genetic sequence that has no meaning, right? But what happens is that in vitro, sometimes, you can delete one of these viruses. You can slice out one of these vi uh, genes, and you don't see any effect. The virus replicates. So there are conditions where you have no VIF, no VPU, or no NEF, and you don't see the difference. Now, you wouldn't, of course, imagine that the virus has something it doesn't need. Uh, the trick is that there are situations in vitro that uh, make uh, this deletion that you make, all of a sudden, uh, evident. So there are cell lines that lack some host factors. There are cell lines that express differential, differentially express host factors that make this difference. OK? So let's call them auxiliary protein instead of accessory proteins. Because, as I said, you would not imagine that the virus has accessory doesn't need it. And uh, a few examples. VPU, it's a 
auxiliary protein that uh, blocks the, uh, the virus when it's coming out of the cell. It basically prevents the virus from detaching from the cells. Uh, sorry, correct this. A VPU counteract a host factor called BST2, which m prevents the virus from leaving the cells. Okay, the th thing is, uh, this factor BST2 is lacking in many cell types. So uh, if you don't have VPU uh, there, you don't see the effect. Yeah. Uh, you have VIF, for instance. Uh, VIF counteracts a cell, a, a cell factor, which is called ApoBec3, uh, which interferes uh, with this stage of the, of the virus replication. And again, ApoBec3 is missing in some cell lines. So if you replicate HIV there, you can do it without VIF. So having said this, uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about this other protein, um, which has become, has remained particularly mysterious for quite a long time. And uh, it's, it's a small protein, about 30 kilodalton, which is myristylated, so it tends to associate to membranes. And it's known uh, to be present only in, uh, in the genome of lentiviruses that infect primates. So HIV-1, HIV-2, and the simian counterpart, SIV. So it's a very specific protein present in a very small context of this phylogenetic tree. What do we know about this protein? Actually, we knew uh, much before knowing anything else, we knew that it was an important pathogenic factor because uh, if uh, patients are infected with the virus that happened to lack NEF, and it happened just by mistake sometimes, it's very rare, patients can go on for 30 years without therapy, without even noticing that they are infected. Okay. So there is a famous court in, uh, in Australia, for instance, that was a recipient of a blood transfusion that happened to have a NEF negative virus. And these people that were all hemophiliac, by the way, they survived for a very long time without problems. So why, what does NEF do? Well, it actually does many things, and that's part of the problem. Uh, because for a long time we know that NEF is particularly good at uh, modulating a surface expression level of, uh, of molecules in the cells. So it then regulates the primary receptor CD4 or MHC class 1 or other, actually, there's a, a range of, of molecules that have been reported to be affected, uh, of which the expression is affected by NEF. Uh, and this has specific functions, of course. The moderating the receptor, for instance, prevents superinfection of, of cells. Uh, then there, is a, uh, there are other prominence activity of NEF, which are the ability of the protein to activate cellular kinases and therefore to uh, to lower the threshold for activation of primary cells. Um, there is an effect on cell motility. There is an effect on apoptosis. All these things are relatively well characterized. Today, what we are going to see is uh, this effect that the NEF has, and which remains really confusing. So what happened is that the cell infected start to produce virus, and that virus it's much more infectious normally if there is NEF around. Okay. So just keep in mind this uh, concept. Uh, it's not that NEF increases the amount of virus that is released. Okay. But NEF increases the fitness of the virus. Okay. And to say increases is not probably correct. Let's say that the virus without NEF has a defect. Yeah? So it requires NEF to be fully infectious. And in fact, what you see here are blue dots. Every one of these blue dots is infected cells. And these two monolayers have been infected with the same amount of virus. So one just happened to be much better than the other. So there is a defect in infectivity here, which can be very large, sometimes even hundredfold. And we have no clue why. And this has been going on for about 20 years now. So why is this virus more infectious when there is NEF? 
Well, obviously, the viral particle is more, uh, has more fitness. So it inherits something here when it comes out to the producer cell. And then when you infect target cells, the virus has just more chance to make it. So something happened, and we know that something happened at the very beginning. Uh, probably at the moment when the virus entered the cell or immediately after. Even this is question very much debated right now. So why is this difference there? What does NEF do to the virus? This is what it's going to be about today. So the first story I tell you uh, comes from uh, a consideration, starting consideration. So the virus is, uh, I wouldn't say simple, but there's not that many viral proteins at the end in, in the viral particle. There is an envelope glycoprotein which is required to make the virus to, to enter the cell, to fuse with the, with the cell. There is a matrix, there is capsid, there is nucleocapsid, and there are enzymes. So far, we have no clue that NEF changes these components of the virus, OK? But I was kind of attracted by the fact that there is evidence that, now, I don't know if you know what a, a, virus, a, a virus pseudotype is. Um, so you can mix, basically, components of, of a virus. You have virus A and virus B. You can, you can mix them so that uh, uh, you, you, you basically have a virus that inside uh, is virus A and on the surface is virus B. It, it, this virus basically uses the glycoprotein from a different virus. And this way you can expand or change the tropism of a virus because this glycoprotein is the one that recognizes a receptor on the target cells. Okay? And what you do, uh, what happens when you do this and you check how much NEF is important for the virus, you realize that the envelope glycoprotein makes a lot of difference. So uh, normally, with an HIV-1 envelope, uh, you have an F-plus virus, which is very much more uh, infectious than an uh, HIV-negative uh, virus. Yeah? But if you pseudotype uh, this same virus with uh, the glycoprotein from the vesicular stomatitis uh, virus, VSVG, uh, NEF doesn't make any difference anymore. So thinking that NEF could target somehow the envelope glycoprotein of HIV specifically, other glycoproteins here are related to another retrovirus, and there is a kind of partial effect, you see. So the effect is, uh, is modulated somehow. It depends on the glycoprotein. So thinking about that, we thought, well, let's check if there is an effect of NEF on the glycoprotein. And, uh, also, because the, the HIV-1 uh, glycoprotein has some uh, uh, tyrosine base or of, of leucine base motifs here, which are recognized to trigger or better recruit uh, adapter protein, uh, clattering adapter complexes, or being recognized anyway by uh, the machinery of the cells which uh, drives vesicular uh, trafficking. And since I told you before, NEF is capable of down-modulated surface proteins. So well, maybe there is an effect there. So we went to check whether HIV-1 envelope is uh, somehow modified or targeted by, uh, by NEF. And what we, uh, the first thing we did was to check uh, the, the level of incorporation of virus into, of envelope into virions. And that was not affected by NEF. So here you have virus particles, Western blot for GP120 and for uh, GP41 or P24, so this is capsid and this is envelope, and you see there is basically no difference in envelope incorporation. So the difference certainly, if NEF makes a difference, that's not in the quantitative amount of the envelope that goes up to the, to the virus particle. So we thought maybe there are some uh, quantitative differences, uh, qualitative differences. So the, the assumption here is, uh, well, if NEF modifies the envelope qualitatively, uh, then perhaps uh, there is an alter binding of envelope to neutralizing agents. And glycoprotein of HIV-1 is perhaps the best glycoprotein studied in history. You have a lot of reagents binding every different epitope to this glycoprotein. So we said, okay, let's probe uh, the envelope glycoprotein with s as many reagents as we can find to see if one uh, binds differently 
which would mean that NEF does something, uh, maybe to glycosylation or to something like that. So we went on to test uh, uh, antibodies, neutralizing antibodies that uh, uh, bind to the C4 binding domain or um, uh, those that are induced by C4 binding. Anyway, just this to say that we try to uh, map different feature on the envelope glycoprotein by checking how well these reagents neutralize HIV in the presence or absence of NEF. Okay, and the um, the, the result was uh, quite clear. So with reagents binding to uh, the, so the envelope glycoprotein is uh, proteolytically cleaved and there is a uh, uh, one unit which is called the, uh, the surface soluble subunit, which is targeted by these uh, reagents. As you can see, these reagents don't make any difference. Uh, NEF doesn't make any difference on how well these reagents can uh, neutralize HIV. So we exclude that there was a, an effect on, on this part of the envelope glycoprotein. However, when we went to check uh, antibodies targeting uh, GP41, which is the subunit of the glycoprotein which is, uh, uh, which is bound to the envelope of, of the viral particle. And in particular, there are some, uh, some antibodies there that bind to a, uh, a domain, a region, which is very close to the membrane. It's, called, it's quite famous. It's called membrane proximal external region because for some reason, the virus there is like an Achilles, Achilles heel of the virus. Antibodies that manage to bind there normally uh, neutralize the virus. Yeah? And what, when we tested those antibodies, we, we noticed that uh, two uh, out of three of these antibodies um, were neutralizing differently HIV-1 with NEF or without NEF. Uh, NEF was making uh, this virus much more resistant to, uh, to neutralization. So we thought, ah, maybe we found the proof that finally the NEF does something to the, uh, to the glycoprotein. Uh, however, it was very confusing because for instance, this antibody, although it's not very potent, uh, could neutralize equally well both, uh, both viruses. This effect is quite specific uh, for, for only for antibody that targets this region. And uh, we wanted to know uh, if this really correlated with different bindings. So we basically uh, set up a virus capture assay using these antibodies. It's basically an immunoprecipitation using the same antibodies that we use for neutralization. And following the logic that if the antibody uh, neutralizes better, probably it's because it binds better. And so it should capture more virus. So this is the capture assay, we just pull down the virus, measure how much virus we have, and the result is this antibody which um, uh, um, neutralizes differently NEF plus and NEF minus virus can capture indeed more uh, NEF uh, minus virus. Uh, and specifically antibodies that neutralize equally well both capture the same amount of, uh, of virus. So, uh, sorry, the glycogag part I forgot the name. So NEF um, is uh, altering somehow epitope availability on this virus particle. Uh, so let's see how this uh, region is, uh, what is this region, this membrane proximal external region. So it's something like this. There are two helices that are half buried into the lipid uh, bilayer of the viral particle. And the epitopes that uh, um, this antibody recognize are these uh, are indicated here and as you can see uh, the uh, residues important for recognizing 2F5 and 4E10 these two antibody for which NEF makes difference they happen to be basically hidden uh, within the, the lipid bilayer so the idea here was that perhaps uh, NEF makes uh, makes these epitopes uh, available, more available, sorry, less available, difficult to see, because in the presence of NEF, these helices are, are much, uh, uh, much more tightly bound to the, to the envelope, like protein. And in fact, there, is, uh, there are uh, data in literature which suggest that NEF modifies the lipidome of the virus, and uh, the modification uh, end up being an increased amount of cholesterol and sphingomyelin 
which is reported to be important for the association of emperor, in fact, of this region of the envelope like protein. So the model is that the uh, uh, envelope changes the lipidome and, and therefore makes this glycoprotein to be better associated with the lipids and uh, hiding a very crucial epitope to, uh, to the antibodies. So this is what we imagine would happen in the absence of NEF, but not in the presence of NEF. Now, the question is, I started to talk about this because we wanted to know now if this explains also the infectivity problem issue. Why NEF plus is more infectious than NEF minus? Is that the case? Well, to answer this question, we just went to look at the mutants of NEF. Mutants of NEF, which as you can see here, uh, are all um, capable of making neutralization of HIV more difficult. Here you have this w sing or this uh, uh, FD mutant or this polyproline mutant. Among these mutants, only the meristylation, the mutant that have no meristylation site, seems to lose the ability of making NEF more uh, resistant to neutralization. This is what happened with neutralization, but when you look at the infectivity, this is what happened. So the same mutants that are still capable of promoting resistant neutralization are not capable to promote infectivity. So there is a dissociation of these two phenotypes. Okay. So basically, what, what does this mean is that we found a phenotype that has nothing to do with infectivity, but still has some relevance because it, it increases uh, neutralization resistance. We have actually more data that suggests that this is the case. So the conclusion of this first little story is that uh, we found uh, that NEF makes uh, the virus more resistant to neutralization with MPR antibodies. And this is uh, independent, and it's a novel activity of NEF. So uh, now we're, we're trying to look if this is, has real relevance in vivo, so we, we want to investigate this in plasma of patients. But the story now goes on, because having failed to find uh, what makes uh, NEF more infectious, we try, we start again, all over again. And, uh, the second story is called Nef is not alone because there was a surprise at the end of this story too. And it starts here. It starts with the observation that uh, how much Nef increases infectivity depends on which cell type you use to produce the virus. Okay. So this tells you how much more infectious the virus with Nef is compared with the virus without Nef when you produce them from the, uh, using these cell lines. And as you can see here, it's quite striking because you have groups of very uh, closely genetically related cell lines which have a very different phenotype in terms of NEF. In fact, you have one, two, three, four cases here of cells that don't require NEF to make infectious virus. Okay? So in cells where NEF has no contribution to infectivity, so we, th we thought, OK, we got it. Now we need to find what's in, this, in these cells. What is there in these cells? Luckily, at that time, we were developing an RT assay. This is an assay that uh, uh, detects the presence of retroviruses in general in any biological sample. And when we apply this RT assay to our cell lines, we realize that these cell lines that had no NEF contribution to infectivity had already something in there that was making a reverse transcription. Basically, they were containing already a retrovirus. Now, check your cells. You never know what you find on your cells. There's all sorts of things you can find in cells. Uh, this clone of Jurkat, for instance, uh, probably it was, it, was, it was put through a mouse to be established. And he picked up some endogenous retrovirus from the mouse. So now you have a clone of Jurka that has constitutively, constitutively expressed a gamma retrovirus, which is murine leukemia virus. Uh, anyway, I can explain to you how viruses ended up in these cell lines. We can talk about this later. For now, 
the, the association about not requiring NEF in the presence of a completely unrelated electrovirus were quite striking. In fact, um, these cells harbor all these four cell lines, a gamma retrovirus, very close to murine leukemia virus, okay? So at that stage, we thought, okay, look, th this is what it is. You put purposely murine leukemia virus into jerk cells, and the virus that exit basically is extremely infectious, even without NEF. So what is in this virus? This virus is a simple one. Remember, I told you at the beginning, very simple structure, no accessory proteins, but obviously there, there is something that the virus need, that the virus has, which compensates for the lack of NEF on GFP. So to cut the story short, we did the um, mapping of what in the genome was uh, required. And uh, to our astonishment, it was a region here that was required. So what is there, there that is required and has a, a, a NEF-like function, even on HIV? So if you look back on literature, you find out that gamma retroviruses are not this simple because at the beginning, they can make a longer version of this GAG protein. So GAG is the protein, is the protein, is the stru main structure of protein of the virus. But gamma retroviruses are able to start trans translation from a suboptimal CUG uh, start codon. If you look at this, this is quite a good COSAC sequence, except that there is no A here, it's a C. So in 50% of the cases, the virus start translating. It start translating there. And the result from this translation is a longer version of GAG that goes into or in frame into ordinary GAG. But it has a uh, signal peptide just here. So this becomes a transmembrane protein. And it's a transmembrane protein type 2. So it has C terminals outside and N terminals inside. OK. Then this protein uh, is cleaved. This is secreted and what stays attached to the membrane of the virus or the producer cells is this. This can be found in virions, but to uh, tell you the story, so you prevent translation from there and, and you prevent also a translation of glycogag, you can see here, and HIV cannot find support anymore from MLV. So glycogag is the protein in gamma retroviruses that basically has an F-like function. And here I could go on to show you that the, the effect is really the same because, uh, first of all, the effect is the same on MLV also, so on gamma retroviruses. You can see here, plus or minus glycogag, there's actually quite a big difference in infectivity. Uh, so it's a positive factor for gamma retroviruses. And it's very similar to what NEF does to HIV. Uh, there is kind of specular uh, activity which depends on the envelope of glycoprotein, something I showed you before. So in the, in the present VSVG, for instance, there's no need of glycogag, nor NEF on HIV, nor glycogag on MLV. And it still depends on the cell type where the virus is produced. So you have certain cell types where the requirement is very low. And this is the same for glycogag on NEF. So we think that there is a common host factor there that regulates uh, the requirement of these two proteins for these two different viruses. And by the way, they localize in, in exactly the same places inside the cell. Now, the astonishing thing is that there is not a slight hint of sequence conservation, okay? But yet the function is identical, basically. Okay, so perhaps that's what we should do. Remember that this is not a, such a simple retrovirus. There is another protein there. Oh, well. And the second, uh, the second uh, conclusion here is that, um, well, NEF is there, but really, it's also there. Something similar is also there in this big group of viruses, okay, which includes mammalian uh, retroviruses uh, from uh, uh, mice or cats or other animals. So we have a case of convergent evolution, and this means that probably this is a fundamental pro property of retroviruses because there is there a, a reason that uh, pressed different viruses to come up with the same the same solution. The question is, 
is there another net factor somewhere else? By chance, we found that there was one here now. What about any, anywhere else? So we, we, we started looking at this now, and we just uh, choose some candidates that had possibility to have other net factors. For instance, EIAV, this is equine infectious anemia virus. There is a little protein here called S2 that no one, has, does, no one knows what it does. It's very much required to cause the pathology in horses that are infected. It's a, still a, a protein, a, a virus, this one, that uh, infects hematopoietic lineages. So we thought, oh, let's see if this protein has also an F, an F like function. And guess what? It does. So it can recover the uh, defective infectivity of uh, HIV-1 without NEF very efficiently, as efficiently as glycogagrin, not more. So this is the third case now of a protein. And I can assure you that the sequence has no similarity again, neither with glycogag nor with NEF. But yet, it's a third case of a convergent evolution example, which uh, obviously means that there is something that the virus has to deal with. And just to go on again, S2, this protein accessory, okay, auxiliary protein of EIAV, has exactly this, the phenotype you would expect. It does not depend on, uh, th this is a cell line that we know where NEF doesn't make any difference, and S2 doesn't make any difference neither. If you pseudotype with the SVG, there is no need of S2 anymore. So the effect is really down to that specific defect that HIV has without NEF. Okay, so story two, uh, the conclusion here is that uh, we have found now example, we, we're, I hope we're gonna find more, we're testing other retroviruses. Ex enough examples to say that uh, uh, these factors are um, functionally related. Uh, they have evolved by convergent evolution and normally when this happens, it means that there is a ma major problem there that viruses have to deal with. And we have enough data to say that probably this is uh, to do with uh, hematopoietic tropic retroviruses, okay? And I, you'll see why I'm saying this later. So we're now trying to find out how many more of these factors there are. And especially, still now, this, uh, this does not answer the question, what do they do to the virus to make it so more infectious? Okay, so that's the third story. What do they do to the virus to make it more infectious? Now, we suspected, of course, that uh, there is a host factor there that makes this requirement evident. We just needed to find this host factor. And we start from this. Uh, so having failed to, to have cell lines clearly negative for the requirement of NEF, because what we found at the end was contaminated with other retroviruses, which was useful because we found something else, but still. Uh, we screened much, much more cell lines. And uh, finally, we got cells which we know are clean from retroviruses, apart from MT2, actually, which, which grow uh, fully replicating HTLV, but that doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Anyway, this, uh, this range, which goes from, from 1 to 40 in our case, we thought to use this uh, the best way possible. And if you look, this is, you can see what I meant before. Most of these cell lines are uh, hematopoietic origin, okay? And so most of the cell lines were, um, actually all of the cell lines where NEF is strongly required are blood cells which makes sense, right? HIV is a lymphotropic virus, and so is MLV, by the way. So it must be something that is expressed there somehow, or lacking there, we don't know. In fact, this is a, for a fundamental question. Is this something really expressed here and lacking here, or the opposite? So we try to answer this question by taking the first cell line here and the last here, and fuse them together, and trying to see the phenotype of the virus generated by these few cells is dominant or not. So this is what we did. HT1080 cells, Jurka cells, they have opposite phenotypes. We fused them, harvested virus, produced in the, in the presence or absence of NEF, 
and see what happened. And what happened is quite clear. So these are HTN80 cells fused with HTN80 cells. These are cells that are non responsive for NEF. And they produce virus which is not responsive to NEF. When you fuse JURCAT with JURCAT, cells which is highly responsive to NEF, the progeny virus remain responsive. Crucially, when you fuse HTN80 with JURCAT, the progeny virus resemble very much the JURCAT virus. So what does this say? This say that, uh, uh, by the way, this works with glycogag too. Uh, this says that uh, there is something in the NEF responsive cells which actively makes cells to be NEF responsive. What does it mean? Our interpretation is that uh, the blood cells have an inhibitor of HIV, which is counteracted by NEF, okay? which is basically the same that I've shown you before with VPU and VIF, uh, something that we call a restriction factor for retroviruses. So it's an active inhibitor, dominant active inhibitor of retroviruses. OK, now, uh, first of all, let's try to make a kind of model out of this. Uh, we found this, uh, th this is our hypothesis, OK, that there is a cl basically this related molecule, this NEF-like molecules, they all probably counteract a same inhibitor, which is present prevalently in uh, hematopoietic cells. Now, we try to ask ourselves first, the, these, these proteins have nothing in common, okay? Glycogag has two and NEF. But they must have something in common. And indeed, there is something in common. Uh, and we know for quite some time, even. So NEF requires, for instance, a dilucis-based sorting pathway for optimal infectivity and also for CD4 down regulation, but for optimal infectivity. What does that mean? It means to recruit an ad a cluttering adapter complex. So somehow endocytosis there is involved to make the virus more infectious. This actually is from 1994. Recently, Heinrich Gottlinger published that glycosylated GAG, the protein we've been talking, also depends a cluttering adapter uh, protein complex to uh, affect virus infectivity. So a common denominator here is to recruit something that has to do with an endocytosis. And indeed, a few years ago, with Heinrich, actually, when I was postdoc there, uh, I found that NEF recruits, by co-IP, NEF recruits dynamine 2. And not only recruits dynamine 2, but it requires dynamine 2, and it requires the interaction with dynamine 2 to have this effect it has on infectivity. Now, what, the, what is dynamine 2? Dynamine 2 is a protein required for endocytosis because it's a protein that oligomerizes around the neck of an endocytic vesicle. So it, it's for, for, for vesicular trafficking, you need biogenesis, you need uh, dynamine 2 when cluttering is involved. So somehow, also we know that cluttering, if you knock down cluttering from producer cells, uh, or somehow you express a dominant, actor, dominant acting inhibitor of, of the cluttering uh, pathway, you also prevent the ability, you also impair the ability of NEF to, to, to counteract whatever it has to do, okay? So the common denominator seems, seems this. And we just found that there is a, a possible AP2, adapter for protein binding motif, also in, uh, in S2, in this third protein of equine anemia infectious virus. And we are actually testing now, this weekend, to see if this is also uh, crucial for what S2 does to virus infectivity. So association with membranes, because here we have a transmembrane, predicted transmembrane helis, by the way, in this protein. And NEF is meristylated, so you associate with membrane. And glycograg has a transmembrane domain. So these two components seem to be a common denominator of these factors. So having said that, I just want to thank uh, the people in the lab that uh, did most of the work, uh, which are Christiana and uh, 
Anna Chiara and Serena, Christiana and Anna Chiara are two PhD students, Serena is the postdoc in the lab. Uh, we've done this with the NGS facility at the University of Trento, which is led by Veronica. And uh, Federico uh, was the input of so the Federico was very, really essential to crack the information of the transcriptomic and, uh, and the funders. And uh, if you have any question, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs>